Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to Babylon Talmud. Today we're studying the Kuf of uh, Mestachta Shabbos. Um, yeah, all I want to say is basically good luck, not just to you, to me too. And yeah, basically, it just feels like we're taking, remember like the first parak of Mestachta Shabbos was like really uh, difficult? So it feels like they basically just took like the most difficult Gemaras from the first parak and just reprinted them here. So, uh, Good luck to us all. Okay, Daftari Tes Amud Bez all the way at the bottom. Amar Rava said, Rava Pshitali Mayim Agabi Mayim Hanuana Chasan. Okay, so Rava says that it's obvious to me that when it comes to water, on top of water, that is like how it rests. So, for example, if I was, let's say, in Rishus Harabim and there was a pit, and in that pit there was uh, water. So, Kilo, there was a Pit that was ten tefachim deep by four tefachim wide, so it was rishus hayachid, and there was water in there. If I stick my hand in there and I, you know, pull out some water, so that's going to be um, an akira. You're going to be taking out the akira and you bring it into rishus arab. You're going to be chayav. Egos agabi ma'im lav hanu anachasim. But if you have a nut that's floating on top of the water, so we don't consider that nut to be at rest. And if you pull the nut out of the water into rishus arab, well, it's not going to be an akira of the nut from. Uh, Rishus Ayachid, so you will be Potter. By Rava, Rava wants to know, Egos Bechli, Uchli Tzaf Al Gabi Maim, Mau, Memrinum Basar Egos Azlinan, Vanaich, Odoma Basar Kli Azlinan, Valonaich, Teku. Great. So Rava wants to know, what if you have a nut, and that nut is in a, is in a, um, like, vessel, and that vessel is floating on water, and then you take the nut out of the vessel, right? So you have a pit, the pit is 10 tefachim deep by 4 tefachim, by 4 tefachim wide, uh, so it's a Rishus Ayachid. Now floating on top of the water over there in the pit is a vessel. Now in the vessel is a nut. Now, on the one hand, the nut is in the vessel and it's resting in the vessel. So I might think that if I take the nut out of the vessel, so I'm basically doing an akira. I'm taking it out of the vessel. I'm taking it, and that's in Rishus Ayachid. I'm taking it to me in Rishus Arabim. So I should be chayev, right? Well, yeah, if you look at it that way, but there's another way to look at it. Well, the nut is in a vessel and the vessel is floating on the water. And since the vessel is floating on the water, you can argue that the vessel isn't actually, you're not, you know, it isn't actually nach, isn't actually resting on anything. And by taking the nut out of this thing that isn't resting, so maybe it's not really considered like you're doing an akira on the nut. So guess what the Gemara says? Leave me alone, teku, let's move on. Shemin al gabi yain, if you have oil that is floating on top of wine. Machlokas of Yochan and Benuri Rabbanan. Okay, so it's a machlokas. The Tanan is we learn in the Mishnah. Shemen Shetzaf Agabe Yain. If you have um, oil that is floating on wine. Vinaga Tvul Yom. Beshemen. Sweet. Then a Tvul Yom. Our friend who was Tame. Let's say he was a Zav or something. And, and now it's his seventh day and he's all, you know, hasn't seen Ziva and he's really happy and excited. Goes to the mikvah. Really exciting times. Um, so now it's his last day of being a Zav, went to the mikvah, and he's a Tvul Yom until the evening. Now a Tvul Yom, of course, has a default status of a Sheni Latuma. Now if he touches um, wine, uh, oil or wine, that is um, Truma, so he's going to make it Puzzle. So what happens is our Tvul Yom friend over here, um, he touches oil that is Truma and he makes, so the question is, okay, so he definitely makes the oil Puzzle. The question is, does he make the, um, what, what, what's the status of the, uh, wine? What's the status of the wine? So if you say that the oil that's floating on the wine is separate from the wine, well, when our Tvul Yom friend touched the oil, so the oil becomes puzzle, and once it's puzzle, it can't make the wine tummy anymore, or puzzle, or whatever it is. It's done. But if, the wine and the oil are considered connected, just like we said that water is, you know, if you have, you know, water is considered connected with other water. So if we say that the oil and the wine are considered one thing, well, then when our friend touches the oil, it's also going to apostle the wine. That's our question. Right. So again, so the Gemara says four lines into the Gemara and Dafkuf. Shemen al gabe yain. So if you have wine and on top of the wine is oil. And the question is, is the oil, so, and of course the nafkamina for Shabbos is, what happens if I take out the oil from the wine, right? If we say that it's considered all one unit and connected to the wine, 
well then it'll basically be like if I take water, if I stick my hand into water and pull out water, we say that that would be considered an akira, and I bring into Rosh Hashanah and Sa'anacha. So if we say that the wine and the oil are considered connected, well then by removing the oil from the wine, well then I'm going to be doing an akira. However, if I say that the oil and the wine are not connected, therefore the oil is just floating on top of the wine. That's basically like a nut that's floating on top of, of, of liquid and uh, it's not considered at rest. And therefore, if I remove it, if I remove the oil from the wine, it would not be considered an Akira. So um, I'll get to the answer because I'm sure you guys are all waiting. So, so, so says the Gemara, four lines into the Gemara, Shemen Agabe Yain, if you have oil that's on top of wine, Machlokas Rabbi Yochanan Benuri Rabbanan. So the Maise it's Machlokas between Rabbi Yochanan Benuri and the Rabbis. Ditnan, as we learn in a Mishnah, a Mishnah in Masechta Tvu Yom. Shemen Shetzaf Al Gabe Yain. So if you have oil that's floating on top of wine, Vinagabo Tvu Yom, and our Tvu Yom friend touches the oil, right? B'Shemen Lo Pasal El Shemen. So according to the Chachamim, you only that only makes the oil pasal. Okay, but the wine remains fine, which means that Lagabe Shabbos, what the Chachamim are saying, is that the oil is considered separate from the wine, and it's just floating on the wine, and there's, it's not considered nach, it's not considered, you know, planted on the wine, and if you would remove the oil on Shabbos, you'd be putter, because um, there's no akira. Rabbi Yochanan Benuri, Omar Shneim, Chibor Zelazet, whereas Rabbi Yochanan Benuri said, no, they're connected, and therefore if our friend touches the oil, so then it also makes the wine puzzle, which would mean the Gabe Shabbos, that if you would remove the oil from the wine, he would basically be doing an Akira. And then when he brings it into Rosh Hashanah, he'd be chayev for the Hanukkah. Let's move on, friends. Amar Abaye, Bor Rosh Hashanah, okay, so if you have a pit, and the pit is in Rosh Hashanah, Amok, Amuka Asar, Rechav Hashmon, great. And it's 10 Tvachim deep, and it's 8 Tvachim by 8 Tvachim wide. Or probably even eight tefachim by four tefachim wide. It doesn't matter, but but the point is that you can divide it in half. Kaze vizarek l'socha machzelas chayv. So if you now throw into this pit a some kind of a, a reed, some kind of a mat, so then you're going to be chayv because you just threw epis from rishusa rabim into rishus ayachid. Right? This pit is ten tefachim deep. It's more than four tefachim by four tefachim. Chayv buster chilka ba machzelas potter. However, says Abai. If you take this mat, and the mat is um, 10 tefachim tall, and it's large enough to base, to make a, 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 a separation in this pit, to basically divide the pit into um, two sizes of 4x4, four four. but the thing is that it's actually going to be a little bit less than 4x4, four four because the mat itself takes up some space. So, meaning initially, the way I'm imagining it is you have this pit, it's 10 tefachim deep, and it is, you know, 8 tefachim by 4 tefachim wide, okay? Now, you then take this mat, and it is, let's say, 4 tefachim wide and 10 tefachim uh, tall, and you stick it in there in order to divide the pit in half. Now, what ends up happening is neither one of the two sides of the pit is four tefachim by four tefachim because the mat itself takes up some space. So basically, um, you know, it's going to be a little bit less than four tefachim wide. So it says, um, Abaye, you are potter. Now here's the interesting thing. Um, remember yesterday we had those, we had the question of what, what happens if you have a pit that is ten tefachim deep and four tefachim by four tefachim wide and then you take some dirt and you chuck it into the pit so now it's no longer 10 tefachim deep. So we said, well, it depends. If you view it from the way it was at the beginning, which was that, well, it started off at 10 tefachim deep and you threw this dirt into a pit that's 10 tefachim deep. So we say that you're chayv. But at the same time, we're, we would, the other way to look at it was saying, well, um, the sort of nullification of the pit and the throwing in of the dirt is happening at the same time, right? Which means that when the dirt lands in the pit at that same exact time, it's also making it not deep enough to be a Rosh Hashayachet anymore. So you can, so, so how would that apply to this case? So in this case, you know, on the one hand, he's putting the mat into a pit that is 10 tefachim deep and is more than 4 tefachim by 4 tefachim wide. However, at the same time, by putting it in, he's also making the, splitting this pit into two halves that are neither Four tefachim by four tefachim wide. So how do you view this? So the Gemara answer. So 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 Abaye says, Potter, right? So again, Amar Abaye. Abaye says, Bor b'shusarabim. 
If you have this pit rishus around amuka asar, it's ten tefachim deep, or chava shmona, and it's uh, eight tefachim wide, okay. Vizarak the soch machzel is chayv. If you throw a re a mat into there, well you'll be chayv because you threw from rishus a rabim into rishus a yachid. Chilka b'machzel but if you divide it with the machzel and now neither uh, half of the pit is uh, 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 you know four tefachim by four tefachim. Uh, potter. So Abayi says potter, even though at the time that you put in this mat, you put it into a mat, in, into a pit that was 10 tefachim deep and more than 4 tefachim by 4 tefachim, but lemaise, when you, um, by putting in this mat, you are now making it less than 4 tefachim by 4 tefachim, so therefore you're going to be potter, according to Abayi. Now, the Gemara says Abayi, so according to Abayi, who says that over here, in this case, when you put in the mat, your potter, well then, the pshitale, the machzelis, mevatala, mechitza, kol shekein chulia, the mevatala, mechitza. Well then, certainly, if he says that in this case, where, when you put the mat into this pit, you're going to be potter, because we're saying that it's no longer four by four, certainly, when you, in yesterday's case, when you would take dirt and throw it into this pit, that's ten tefachim deep, um, you know, and four tefachim by four tefachim wide, so certainly in that case, you would be potter because over there, your mom is making it not even a Rishus HaYachid anymore. Kilu, over there, it was 10 Tfachim deep and now you're putting in the dirt, it's not even 10 Tfachim deep. Like like the whole, you know, construct that would make a Rishus HaYachid is just gone, right? You don't even have walls that are 10 Tfachim deep anymore. In this case, you still do have walls that are 10 Tfachim deep, right? And all the walls still exist, right? They're all there. You just put up an additional wall in the middle, but you weren't mavatal anything. You didn't actually destroy anything. Right? Um, and he's saying your putter in that case, when you add the mat in the middle, well then certainly in the case where you actually like destroy the walls, right? You add walls that were 10 tefachim deep and it, like it's just not even a 10 tefachim pit anymore, right? Um, so you'd have to like actually redig it in order to make it a Rosh Hashanah. So certainly in that case, um, Abai would say that you'd be putter. Now the Rabbi Yochanan to me, Baya le Chulia. Um, now, over the, Rabbi Yochanan, on the other hand, we take sort of the opposite approach, which is that he, when it comes to the pit, where you mamish like armavatal the pit by adding dirt, it's like it's not even or it's just ayachid anymore whatsoever. You'd have to redig it, right? And over there, Rabbi Yochanan is not sure. Um, you know, do we say that you armavatal the pit and you'd be potter, or do we say but you threw it into a pit that's ten uh, tefachim deep lemaise, so maybe you'd be chayev? So certainly in this case where, you know, everything stays the same, the walls are still 10 tefachim deep, right? Uh, and all the walls still exist. You just literally put a reed in the middle. Certainly there you would be chayev because um, uh, he doesn't have his suffix about maybe you destroyed the pit or not. You didn't destroy anything. You just added a, added another wall. So you would say over there, you would certainly be chayev. Ram Rabbi, it says Abai, bor b'shus arabim. Okay, if you have a pit, that's in the public domain. Amuka asara or chava arba. Great, and it's ten tefachim deep, and it's four tefachim by four tefachim wide. Okay, sounds like Roshisa yachid to me. Malaya maim, and it's filled with water. All right, very exciting. Vizark the socha, and you throw a stone inside of it. What do you guys think? I think it's chayiv or potter. Standing Roshisa rabim takes a stone, chucks it into this Roshisa yachid pit that's filled with water. So the Gemara says chayiv. Malaya peris. Vizarak the Socha Potter. However, if the um, pit is filled up with fruits, i.e., it's filled up with like um, solids, well, then you'll be Potter. My time, how come? Well, Maim lo mevatle mechitsasa, Paris mevatle mechitsasa. Because water won't be mevatle the mechitsis of the Rishasayachid, but fruits will. Um, you could think about it like this, right? Think about it like this. Let's say you have a pit, okay? And it's tenth, it's in Rishasarab. And it's 10 tefachim deep, it's 4 tefachim wide, so I eat, it's this little Rosh Hashanah Let's say you take a whole bunch of dirt and you fill up the pit. Well, then you don't have a pit anymore, right? You just filled it back in with dirt. So imagine if you didn't fill it in with dirt, but instead you filled it in with fruits. So it's the same thing. Kilu, you're taking solid material and you're filling up this pit with this solid material. You don't have a pit anymore. However, that only applies to solids. If you fill it up with water and, you know, you can throw a stone in that, it'll sink to the bottom. Well, the walls of the, we treat it as though the walls of the pit remain intact, and it would be Kielu, you threw something into Rishas Hayachid, and you will be Chayev. Very exciting stuff, right? Tan and Amiyachid, we also learn in Abraisa, Hazorik men ayom le Isratya. Cool. Somebody who throws from the sea. Now, the sea is a Carmelis, okay? And you throw that into some kind of a highway, Kielu, running next to the sea. Highway 1 in California. You throw from the Pacific Ocean to Highway 1, okay? 
So, so umina israta liyam, or you throw from Highway One into the Pacific Ocean, Potter. I assume the Pacific Ocean is a harmless. Why not, right? So Potter. Fine. Reb Shimon Omer says Reb Shimon im yesh b'makom shazarak amok asara v'rachav ayba achayv. Okay. Now Reb Shimon says, however, if in the Pacific you had dug out for yourself some kind of place for you to stand, and that place is uh, ten tefachim deep and four tefachim by four tefachim wide, so kilu, even though it's filled up with water, it doesn't matter. We treat the walls of your little trench uh, to be intact, and you're going to be standing in erushus ha yachid. And you take uh, your stone and you throw it from your little trench into Highway 1. So you're going to be chayev because you threw from Rosh Hashayach to Rosh Hashayach. Sorry, buster. Friends, new Mishnah. Hazorik Arba Amos Bakotel. Sweet. So somebody who throws Epis um, from four Amos away and he throws it at a wall. Okay. So if it, if it hits the wall above 10 Tfachim, Kizarik Ba'avir, as we've seen already a number of times, um, he threw it above the wall. Um, now, all right, I'll just translate it, you know, you know, Jeopardy style. We know the answer, right? What's it talking about? Guy throws a dried fig, it gets stuck against the wall, um, above ten tefachim, so it's kilo, it's just hanging in the air, uh, and above ten tefachim is a makum p'tur, so he's potter. Um, Lamata may asar et fachim, but if he throws it against the wall and it gets stuck below ten fachim, while kizarik ba'aretz, while below ten fachim is a, uh, you know, rishus harabim goes up ten fachim. And remember, it's not landing on top of the wall, it's landing against the face of the wall. So it's not, you know, if it landed on a surface that was below ten fachim, well then, then, you know, it depends how wide was the surface, maybe it's a karmas, maybe it's a makam p'tur, but here it's not landing on top of something, it's landing smack against the face of the wall. And it's below ten fachim, which is considered uh, you know, Rishus Arabim goes up ten tefachim, so therefore he's going to be a uh, chayav. Okay. So he said, right? Lamata me asar tefachim because Zorik ba'aretz. If it's below ten tefachim, so it's kilu. He threw it on the ground. He's going to be chayav. Zorik ba'aretz ar ba'amis chayav. Now, if he throws it on the land for amis, well, if you throw something for amis and Rishus Arabim, you're going to be chayav. So the Gemara asks, v'ha lo nach. Now. The Gemara doesn't know that we're talking about a dried fig yet. So the Gemara thinks we're talking about a tennis ball. So the Gemara wants to know, right? Well, one second. If you're standing four amos away from the wall and you throw the tennis ball at the wall, well, it's just going to bounce right back and you didn't actually throw it four amos because it's going to bounce back into the four amos. So, uh, Amr Rav Yochanan says, Rav Yochanan bedvela shmena shaninu. We're talking about some kind of a sticky fig that you throw against the wall and it gets stuck. I feel like you should probably just eat that sticky fig, unless it's a little too sticky. Maybe it's like wormy and stuff. But figs are pretty good, Lemaise. You know, where, where I grew up in the United States, I don't know if it's United States things, maybe it's a T-neck thing, maybe it's my household thing, I don't know. But we didn't really eat fresh figs. Maybe we would have dried figs sometimes, but fresh figs are where it's at. Those are really good. Those are really good. Let's move on, friends. I'm reviewed on Marav, I'm reviewed you know, in the shuk, shuk machni yehuda, uh, you can get fresh figs. They're really good. All right. Um, says the Gemara, Amr Rav Yehuda, Amr Rav, Amr Bchir. So Rav Yehuda says the name of his teacher, Rav, who says the name of his uncle, Rav Bchir. Zarak l'mayla me'asar. Okay, if a person throws up his above ten tefachim, v'alcha v'nacha b'chor kol shu. Banu l'machlogs of me'er v'abanan. Now this is exciting stuff. So, imagine you have, uh, let's say a wall, okay? The wall is 10 tefachim tall, it's 4 tefachim wide, okay? Now, you throw epis, and it doesn't land um, on top of the wall, or let's say it's 15 tefachim tall, right? And it's 4 tefachim by 4 tefachim wide. Now, it doesn't land on top of the wall, rather it lands, you know, at some, some kind of like, um, uh, what do we call that? What did we call that yesterday? A crevice in the wall. Okay, now this crevice isn't four tefachim by four tefachim wide, but it's part of a larger wall that is four tefachim by four tefachim wide. So the question is, do we see this crevice as if it's like dug out, as if it's like carved out, and, and we treat it as though it's four tefachim by four tefachim or not? Okay, so it says Rav Yehuda in the name of Rab, who says the name of Rav Chiyazarek l'mayla me'asara. So if a person throws epis more, higher than ten tefachim tall against the wall, Okay, 
But it lands, not smack against the wall, which we said would be putter, but it lands um, in some kind of uh, crevice, okay? So, Banu the Machlokas of Meir Rabbanon. So now we have arrived at the Machlokas between Rabbi Meir and the Rabbanon. The Rabbi Meir, the Amar Chokakin Lahashlim Michaev. So, according to Rabbi Meir, whose opinion is that we treat it as if this area was etched out. So, it's Ke'ilu, it landed on this wall above 10 Tvachim on a platform that's etched out that's 4 by 4 Tvachim by 4 Tvachim so Kilu landed on a Rishus Ayachid or really in a Rishus Ayachid so you'll be Chayib the Rabbanon the Amri Ein Chogakin Lashlim Lo Mi Chayib whereas according to the Rabbanon who say that we don't just you know magically etch out uh, in a ma- in imaginary um, area for Tvachim by 4 Tvachim well if we don't say that then Lemaise all it did was just land on this little tiny crevice and it's not considered as if it landed in Rosh Hashanah and you are going to be Potter. So, fine. Tani Nam Yachid, we also learn in a brace like the Zark, the Maila Measar, Ba'alcha Venacha Bechor Kolshu. If a person threw Epis, um, at a wall above 10 Tvachim and it just landed in a little crevice, so Reb Meir Mechaiv Achacham Potim, Reb Meir says, uh, that this fellow will be chayv because we treat it as if this little crevice was etched out. The chacham say you because we don't treat it as if this uh, little crevice is etched out. Amr um, Yudah Amr um, Rab says Rav Yudah in the name of Rab. Tell hamislaket asara mitoch arba. All right, exciting stuff. Let's say you have a little mound, a little like hill. Okay, now it's ten tefachim tall. Okay, but now. Um, it has a radius of four amos, not tfachim, amos, okay? So imagine like in Rosh Hashanah, there's like some little platform and it has a circumference, let's say, of four, no, not circumference, a, a diameter of four amos. And over and, and within that four, and it kind of, what's it called? Like increases in height until 10 tfachim over the course of four amos. You guys get that, right? So like within four amos, it has gone from the earth, it has created a slope, an incline to get to 10 tfachim. okay? So, um, um, so I'm reviewed on my rav, tail, so this little pile, this uh, mound, hamislake, which like goes, you know, gathers itself up in height, asara, 10 tfachim mitoch arba, from uh, four amos, okay? So it gradually increases to a height of 10 tfachim from uh, over over the period of four amos, of the area of four amos, vizarag v'nach agabav, and a person throws epis and it lands on top of this little mound. Chayev, well, then he's chayev, because uh, we consider that steep enough to be considered part, uh, well, not, uh, we consider that, exactly, steep enough to be con- something that somebody won't walk on, right? And therefore it's not part of Rosh Hashanah, it's part of Rish, it becomes Rosh Hashanah, we treat, um, this platform as, as, as if it's basically, um, 10 tfachim tall and more than 4 tfachim by 4 tfachim wide. And it's a Rishus Ayachid, right? However, okay, new, so, so, so where are we? We also learn in a brace like this. Mavoy. Oh, great. Okay, a Mavoy. Everybody remember what a Mavoy is? A Mavoy was like, okay, remember like you have your Rishus Arabim, right? Which is where, you know, all the people are hanging out. So it's just a problem. Now, they would live in these chatzers, right? So you'd have like this uh, chatzer, this courtyard, and in the courtyard, there would be different houses. And all the houses would open up into the courtyard. But then you would have multiple courtyards that would open up into this one shared space, this one mavoy, okay? And then from the mavoy, you would go into your courtyards, and from your courtyards, you'd go into your houses. So, um, so, um, in order to get into your mavoy, you remember you had to have like a kora or a lechi, some kind of, right? In order to be able to carry in that mavoy, which is that area from which you branch off to the different chatzers so you can get to your house. So in that mavoy, in order to be able to carry in the mavoy, you have to have some kind of recognition um, between the mavoy and the Rosh Hashanah so you don't accidentally carry, um, you know, from the Rosh Hashanah into the mavoy or from the mavoy into the Rosh Hashanah because that would be, uh, you know, the mavoy is a, a, a Rosh Hashanah. So, um, and a, a, a kora is a beam that goes from the top of the, you know, that goes across the top of the mavoy. And a lechi is just a beam that stands up vertically by the entrance of the mavoy. Uh, both of them serve the same purpose, which is that you'll see this beam and you will say, oh, 
right, this is where the Mavoi ends, I shouldn't continue carrying into the Rosh Hashanah. Or if you're in the Rosh Hashanah, you'll realize like, oh, this is uh, where the Rosh Hashanah starts, I shouldn't carry into it. So now what happens if, uh, if let's say you have either a, um, so you have your Rosh Hashanah, okay? And then to get from the Rosh Hashanah into the Mavoi, you have to go up like a big hill, okay? Or what if once you get into the Mavoi, you have to go down a big hill in order to get to the Mavoi? So in that case, since there's this big hill between the Mavoi and the Rosh Hashanah, um, or, or at least like, you know, before them, you know, by, by where the Mavoi ends, so do you still need a Lehi or a Korah anymore? Or is this hill, um, a big enough, um, um, you know, Heker to say, oh, there's the hill that leads to Rosh Hashanah. I better, I better not carry over there. So, Tanya, we learn in a, uh, Tanya Namiyach, we also learn in a Bryce like this, Mavui Sheshavet Lesocho. So you have, if you have a, um, Mavui, that the Mavui itself is, is flat. However, Venaise Madron Lerushus Arab. However, to get from the Mavui to Rosh Hashanah, you gotta go down a little hill. Oh, Sheshavet Lerushus Arab, Venaise Madron Lesocho. Or, the Mavoi, to get into the Mavoi, it's on the same level as Rosh Hashanah. But once you get into the Mavoi, you then have to go down a hill to get to the rest of the Mavoi. So, um, so, also Mavoi eno tzarech lo lechiv lo kora. So that Mavoi does not need a, um, lechi or a kora because that, um, that, um, Increase, you know, that hill itself serves as a recognition that, you know, that here you're entering from Rosh Hashanah to the Mavu or from the Mavu to Rosh Hashanah. That if somebody, uh, that if you have this mound that, uh, uh, accumulates 10 amos in, 10 tfachim in height, um, over in a slope of 4 amos, so then if somebody throws something on it, you will be chayev for throwing from Rosh Hashanah into Rosh Hashanah. Um, however, if that slope, excuse me, if that slope, however, um, would be more gradual, right? It would reach the height of 10 tfachim over uh, a, a, an incline of five almost, let's say. Well, then it would, you know, because it's not too steep of an incline, people would actually, like, you know, maybe, maybe step on that mound and, and it would be considered part of Rishus Harabim and you would be, I mean, it would just, whatever laws would govern, uh, throwing stuff in Rishus Harabim. Let's go on. Zarek Lesoch Dalar Amos. Oh, wow, this is exciting. Zarek Lesoch Dalar Amos, Venis Galgal Chutz Dalar Amos. Potter. Okay. If you intended to throw something less than four amos, but the wind blew it outside of four amos, well, you're potter. Chutz the dalad amos, meniskagal the soch dalad amos chayv. If you intended to throw something more than four amos, but the wind put, blew it into the, um, in, in, inside of the four amos, well, you are chayv. Now the Gemara asks, nach. Why should, if I intended to throw something more than four amos, but lemaisa the wind blew it into inside of four amos. Why should I be chayv? Lemaisa it didn't land in Rosh Hashanah. Uh, well, it didn't land outside I, in four amos. So okay, I didn't lemaisa I didn't throw it four amos. Um, so Amr Biochnan Bushenach Al Gabi Mashu. So Biochnan says, yeah, but what it's talking about is that listen to this. So you threw this, let's say I don't know tennis ball. And it, you, you intended to throw more than four amos and it went more than four amos. And then the wind somehow like kind of held it in its place for like an instant before blowing it back into, uh, you know, less than four amos. So in that case, since the wind kind of held it up and it's within three tfachim of the ground, right? So of course, three tfachim of the ground is still considered part of a shisa rabim. So since the wind kind of held it up, for a shtickle inside, uh, you know, outside of four amos and it was within three tfachim of the ground before blowing it back into four amos. So therefore you are chayev and we treat it as if it landed uh, outside of four amos and you're chayev. Tan and Amiyach, we also learn in a brisa like this, Zarek chutz l'dal ramos, if you throw epis outside of four amos, udchafasu aruach v'chnisasu, 
However, it didn't actually land outside of Four Amos. Instead, the wind push it, blew it back into the Four Amos, right? So it didn't actually land at all outside of Four Amos. Even though the wind then in the end pushed it back out of Four Amos. Uh, it's going to, you're going to be a uh, potter. A chazatu, a ruach, mashu. However, if, uh, when you threw this thing, it went more than four amos and the wind kind of held it up for, you know, any amount of time within three tvachim of the ground before blowing it back inside of four tvachim. So, afalpisha chazo vichnisatu chayev. Even though the wind blew it back inside four amos and the maisa, when it landed on the ground, it was within four amos. But because it got held up outside of uh, four amos for whatever amount of time um, um, before being blown back inside, so you're going to be chayev. Isn't that cool? Amar Rava said Rava, Toch gimel lirabanan tzarech hanacha agabi mashu. So this is interesting. So do you remember um, earlier in the parak we had a machlokas between Rabbi Akiva and the Rabbanan? Obviously you guys remember. So... There was a machlokas between Rabbi Kiva and the Rabbanan about if you throw something from uh, one Rishus Hayachid to another Rishus Hayachid and it passes through a Rishus Harabim, right? Rabbi Kiva says that you are Chayib and the Rabbanan said that you are Potter. Now, there was an opinion over there, okay, that was Rav Chilkiya Bar Tovi and we even quoted a Brisa to support of Chilkiya Bar Tovi, which was, and this was on Daf Tzadi Zayin, that even the Rabbanan who say Potter would nonetheless agree that if you throw this item from Rosh Hashayachid to another Rosh Hashayachid by way of Rosh Hashayachid, but it's within three Tvachim of the ground, we would say, even the Chacham would say that you're Chayev. Now, Rava, however, is saying, Amar Rava toch gimol rabbanan tzarech hanacha agabe mashu. That Rava is saying that according to the Rabbanan, when something, uh, it, 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 when, when, when an item passes in Rish, from Rosh Hashayachid into Rosh Hashayachid, uh, within three tvachim of the ground, it would only be considered having landed there if it actually gets, you know, somehow gets blown by the wind in such a way that it would get stuck and stop for a certain amount of time. Meaning, Rav is saying that according to the Rabbanan, if you simply throw an item from one Rishus HaYachid to another Rishus HaYachid and it goes through Rishus HaRabim, even within three tvachim, if it goes straight through, the rabbis would say that you would be pater. You'd only be high if it stops for a certain amount of time, okay? So it sounds like he's arguing, so, well, well, he's arguing with, you know, with Chilki Bartovi and that Brisa, which says that, uh, you'd be high if it's within three tvachim of the ground. So, I, how can Rava argue with the Brisa? I don't know. Um, Yosef Mareim of Okamula Lashmaita. So, Mareimar was sitting and he was teaching this, this teaching of Rava, that even according to the Abundant would have to land to some extent, within three tefachim of the ground. Amalei Ravina l'mreimer, so then Ravina says to l'mreimer, lav hanu masnisin, well, isn't that our Mishnah? V'amr Rabbi Yochanan v'ushanach hagabi mashu? No. So, Mireimar was saying this teaching of Rava, which was that even according to the Rabbanan, um, in order for something, uh, when you throw something to Rishus Harabim, okay, and it's within three tefachim, in order to consider it landing, it would have to um, stop for a certain amount of time. So, uh, Ravina says to Mreimar, well, don't we know that from our Mishnah? What did it say in our Mishnah? Our Mishnah said that if you throw something in Rosh Hashanah, four Amos, and it extends, right, it goes past four Amos, within Rosh Hashanah, then gets blown back into Rosh Hashanah, uh, well, you throw something for Amos and it extends outside of four Amos, then it goes, bl- gets blown back in to within four Amos. So we say that you are going to be, um, Chayev, and we said that that's only if it specifically stops within three Tvachim of the ground for a certain amount of time. So don't we already know that from our Mishnah that in order for something to be considered landing within three Tvachim of, uh, the ground in Rosh Hashanah, it would have to at least stop there for a certain amount of time in the air? So what's the Chiddush of Rava to say that according to the Rabbanan, when you throw something from one Rosh Hashanah to another Rosh Hashanah, by the way of Rosh Hashanah, it would have to stop for a certain amount of time. So, Omar Lei, so Mareimer says to Ravina, Misgalgal ka'amart, misgalgal in sofu lanuach, aval hai came the sofu lanuach, afogadzul onach, kamantunach tami kamashmulan. So, um, 
Miramar says, no, Rava did have to teach us this. How come? Because our Mishnah, of course, is talking about when the wind blows it, right? When you're throwing something in Rosh Hashanah for Amos, the wind then kind of picked it up in some kind of a whirlwind and put it back in Rosh Hashanah, and put it back within Dalit Amos, right? Now, because that's talking about a whirlwind, when now the assumption is when it's in a whirlwind, who knows? Maybe this thing will never hit the floor. Maybe we'll just get stuck indefinitely inside of this whirlwind. And that is why, since it, who knows if it'll ever even hit the floor, it has to stop for a certain amount of time in order for it to be considered as if it landed in Rosh Hashanah. No, well, it's already in Rosh Hashanah. I keep on saying that. As if it landed outside of Dalit Amos, since otherwise it may never hit the ground. Whoa, that's cool. There was just like a little... Uh, electrical kind of glitch. Anyways, but I might think, however, that if, however, I might think that if I, let's say, throw something from one Rishis to another Rishis where obviously, you know, gravity is going to kick in, it's going to hit the ground at some point. So maybe I might think that when it passes through three Tzvachim within the ground, maybe it doesn't actually have to stop for a certain amount of time in order for it to consider as if it landed. Maybe uh, merely going, th- passing through within three Tfachim would be considered enough to be considered as if it landed in Rosh Hashanah since, since it's going to have to land anyways because of gravity. So Kamash Mulan Rava that no, even so, it's only considered as if it landed when it's within three Tfachim if it actually stops for a certain amount of time. Okay, beautiful. Let's go weiter, friends. Hazorik Bayam Arba Amis Potter. If somebody throws uh, something into the sea, for Amos, you are potter because uh, uh, the sea is a Carmelis. So, Midoraisa, you're not going to be chai. It's potter, avalaser. Emayu rikak mayim. Ushusarab malech is Great. If you have some kind of like sandy, gravelly, kind of watery kind of thing. Muddy, gravelly, watery kind of thing. And it's a Ushusarab malech is And it's in the middle of Ushusarab. And people walk through it. Okay. Hazorik. So if you um, throw something into it for Amos, well, you'll be chayv because it's considered part of Rishos Arab. Okay? Now, in order for it to be considered this um, sandy, muddy, watery kind of thing, so it has to be, and for it to be considered part of Rishos Arab, it has to be less than 10 Tfachim deep because if it's 10 Tfachim deep, well, then, of course, it's Rishos Ayachid. Okay? And then, interestingly, the Mishnah repeats itself. That if you have this muddy, sandy, watery thing in Rosh Hashanah um, and people walk through it, so if you throw something into it for Amos, you're going to be Chayev because it's considered part of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, and the Gemara is going to ask, how come we repeat this twice? And we had this Gemara, I think, was it on Taf, uh, was it Chesam Abez or Zayinam uh, It was really hard. Let's see. Um, it was on, oh yeah, Chesam Abez, I think. Yeah, it was on Chesam Abez. It was trying to um, prove Tashmish Haidei Tchak Havei Tashmish Um Anyways, so we're basically going to repeat that confusing Gemara verbatim. Although maybe it won't be as bad this time, we'll see. I guess that's for you guys to judge. All right. Om Lehum Ereban on the Rava. So one of the rabbis asked Rava, so how come basically it had to repeat twice this statement of Rukak Mayim Rushus Harab Malachas Bo Azarik Besoch Dal Ramas Chayv? Literally, the Mishnah Mamish says it twice. Why? So, so, so this Rabbi asked Rabbi says Bishlama Hilu Hilu Trezimne. It's Trezimne. I understand why um, the why the Mishnah had to mention twice about this Rushus Harab the people you know the people walking through. This Rishus Arab. I understand why you had to mention that twice. Why? Because what it's saying is that as long as people walk through it, even if it is Aidead Chak, it's called Hiluch. Tashmish Aidead Chak, Loshme Tashmish. But if people use it for whatever reason, whether it's to put things in it or whatever it is, um, it's not considered uh, Tashmish. Tashmish. It's not considered using it. Meaning, the, so so the point, the reason why it had to say Hiluch twice, right? That that the Rishus Arabim the people walk through it. So the point is, as long as people walk through it, it's going to be considered Rishus Harabim. The sandy, gravelly, watery thing, you know, as long as people walk through it, it'll be considered Rishus Harabim, even if it's Ayyad Chak, right? Even if they don't necessarily want to walk through this sandy, watery, gravelly thing, 
But as long as people walk through it, even if it's Aidea Adchak, even if they only do it because they have to, um, it's considered walking through it and it'll be part of Rishus Rabbim. Now it says Hiluk twice to the exclusion, right, to say that it's only walking, right, that, that people walking through it can say, is what makes it considered Rishus Rabbim. However, um, Tashmish Aidea Adchak, if you have something that people use Aidea Adchak, whether it's to like, you know, store something in there and get back to it later, but they only would store it there, you know, if, 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 if they need to, but it wouldn't, you know, because this was brought at the, in the first parak, uh, comparing it to like a pillar in Rishus Arabim that's nine Tfachim tall, that we said is considered part of Rishus Arabim since people just, it's very convenient to put things down on it. So that's not Shimush Aideh Adchak, that's Mamish, you know, regular usage. The question is, how do you treat something in Rishus Arabim that people would only use Aideh Adchak? And what we're saying in this case is that specifically it mentions Hiluch twice to say that you know, so, uh, this place that people walk through Ayadeh Adchak would nonetheless be considered Rishus Arabim. But if it was a place that people use only when they mamish have to, well, that wouldn't be considered something, you know, a Tashmish of Rabim, something that, that, that the Rishus Arabim uses. It wouldn't be considered part of Rishus Arabim, right? So only Hiluch Ayadeh Adchak is considered Hiluch, is considered part of Rishus Arabim. But if it was Tashmish Ayadeh Adchak, that wouldn't be significant enough to make it be considered part of Rishus Arabim. Okay? So again, so Amalei Aumer Rabban and the Rabbah. So one of the Rabbahs said to Rabbah, Bishlama Hiluch, Hiluch Trezim. I understand why the Mishnah had to mention the concept of walking through this Rakak area um, twice to teach us. That, you know, walk, you know, using this area for walking, even if it's Aide uh, Adchak, even if it's not ideal, would still be considered the public, um, you know, uh, domain. It would still be considered the public using it for walking, uh, and therefore would be considered part of a Shisarabim. But to prove the point that, uh, usage of something, Aideh Adchak, not just walking, but using it to kind of store bags there or whatever it is, Aideh Adchak would not be considered a use of the public and would not be, make that area with Shisarabim. How come I had to mention this concept of the Rakak twice? I don't know what else it would have said, but how come I had to mention Rukak twice? So the Gemara answers, Trezimnei Lamali. So Chad Bimosacham and Chad Bimosacham to teach us that it's not only, um, in the winter that this Rukak, uh, is considered part of Rosh Hashanah, but even in the summer, right? It's both in the winter and the summer, um, this rakak would be considered part of Rishus Arabim. With Shrikhan, we needed to teach both winter and summer. The Tana Chada, because if we would only ta- teach one, Hava mina Hanimile bi Mosachama, right? I might think that maybe only during the summer this rakak would be considered part of Rishus Arabim. Davide in Chele Mazgel Akure Nafshayu, because people might walk through it in order to cool themselves down, because it's hot outside. Hava bi Mosachishamim lo, but during the winter, um, people would not walk through this, um, Rakak at all because they'll get muddy and dirty. And if you're going to say that, um, you know, only during the, 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 um, uh, winter, it would be considered a rakak. Well, that would be the the mitan fe lo ichpaslu. That's because in the winter, these people are, are muddy anyhow. And therefore, uh, they don't care to walk through, they don't care if they walk through this muddy thing. But they wouldn't walk through it during the winter. And that's why I'd have to mention Rakak twice to say that we consider, um, this Rakak to be part of the Shusarabim because people walk through it. And that's both during the winter and it's during the summer. Great. Um, Abai Omar says, Abai, um, it's the, the reason why we needed to mention Rakak twice is to teach us because So Abaye says, well, if it only would have mentioned Rakak once, I would have thought that it's only considered part of the Shusarabim if it is um, less than four Amos. If it's less than four Amos uh, wide or, or large. Because if it's less than four amos, so, you know, it's not worth the hassle of walking around it. So you'll just kind of walk through it. But if it's more than four amos, right, which means it's a big muddy mess, well, then it's worth it just to walk around and detour the thing. Um, and therefore, maybe it wouldn't be considered part of Rishus Arabim, Kamash Malan, that even then it's part of Rishus Arabim. Ravashi Amar Itzdich Sakadati Chamina Hanimile Hecha Dahava Arba'a. Right? Uh, Ravashi says that if it only would have said Rakak once, I may have thought that it would only be considered part of the Shusarabim if it was um, four Tfachim 
wide, right? If it was four tefachim wide, so then people would uh, walk through it. However, if it was less than four tefachim wide, so then people would just jump over it, and it wouldn't actually be part of, you know, something that the Rosh Hashanah uses. So you'd be potter. Vazda Rav Ashi, uh, so Kamash Malan, that you're high for both of them. Vazda Rav Ashi, the time mate, the Amr of Ashi, Ayman Dezarek Venach Aguda de Gamla, Michayev Sherabim Boken Bo. So, um, says Rav Ashi, um, that if you have like some kind of a bridge and on the bridge there's this like little plank that is has a little bit of a gap between the rest of it and it's less than four tfachim by four tfachim if you throw something and it um, lands on that you would still be chai because um, there are people that kind of um, do nonetheless walk on it and even though it's less than four tfachim and many people jump over it but there are people that walk on it as well so therefore it would be considered part of Rishos Aravim just like um, and therefore that, that little plank on the bridge would be chayv if you throw something into there. So here also this um, little rikak thing that's less than fourth fachim, um, it's still going to be considered part of Rishis Rabbim because there are people that will will walk on it nonetheless. Says the new Mishnah, Azarik minayam le'yabasha, minayabasha le'yam. Somebody throws from the sea onto dry land, i.e. from a karmelist to Rishis Rabbim. Or from the Rosh Hashanah to the sea, when a yam lesfino, when a sfina liyam, or from the sea which is a karmelist to a boat which is a Rosh Hashanah yachid, or from a boat which is a Rosh Hashanah yachid to the to the sea which is a karmelist, when a sfina lechaverta pater, or from one boat to another boat, i.e. from one Rosh Hashanah yachid to another Rosh Hashanah yachid. In all those cases, you're going to be pater, right? Because you didn't throw from Rosh Hashanah yachid to Rosh Hashanah rabbin. Fine. Sfinis kishuris zobazo. Okay, if you have two ships that are tied to one another, mitaltel mizolazo, so you can carry. From one to the other. Even if they're not tied to each other, however, even though they're very close to each other, you still would not be allowed to carry from one to the other. It might, it was stated, Svina, when it comes to a boat, Ravhuna Amar, Motsin Emena, Ziz Koshu, Umimale. Ravchizda, Ravba, Ravhuna Amar, Osamakum, Arba, Umimale. Okay, so the question is, if you're in a ship, can you, uh, and the ship is in some kind of fresh water, you know, some kind of boat, and the boat is in some kind of fresh water, um, and you want to take water from the, you know, stream or whatever that you're in. Uh, the question is, can you stick, uh, you know, can you fill up water from this boat that you're in from the, you know, str- you know body of water that the boat is in? So, so Ravuna Amar Motsin Emena Ziz Kolshu Umimale. So Ravuna says what you do is you take some kind of a stick and you attach like a cup or something to the stick. And then from there you can just kind of plop it into the water and pull out your water and enjoy it. Uh Rav Khizda Rabba Barfuna Amre, whereas Rav Khizna Rabba Barfuna say, Osa Makumar Ba Umimale. What you do is you create some kind of space that's for uh by four tfachim, i.e. you create like your own like Rishus Ayachid kind of thing, and you'll have your cup in that Rishus Ayachid kind of thing, and from there you will basically uh fill up the water inside of this Rishus Ayachid that you're making, and then when you bring it back to you in the ship, well then it's just was in a Rishus Ayachid the entire time. And now I don't know if the walls of this um portable Rishus Ayachid would have to be ten tfachim tall. That I don't know. I feel like the answer should have to be yes, but I don't see anything about ten tfachim here, so I'm really not sure. Um anyways. Right, because I feel like in order for something to be considered a wall, it has to be ten tfachim. So maybe it does have to be ten tfachim. Anyways, um Ravhuna Amar Motse Heimena Ziz Kolshu um Umimale. So Ravhuna says all you do is you just stick out a stick with a cup on it. And you could fill up with water. Okay, so again. So, according to Rav Huna, Kasavar, he holds, Karmelis me Ara Mashkinon. Remember, the, the, um, body of water that he's in is a Karmelis, okay? Now, according to Rav Huna, we consider the 10 Tfachim height of the Karmelis, because remember, above 10 Tfachim, which is Sarabim, also Karmelis, would not maintain its status. It would be Makum Ptur. So, according to Afuna, we treat the bottom of the body of water as the bottom of the Karmelis, and then 10 Tfachim higher than that is already Makum Ptur. And assuming that the body of water is more than 10 Tfachim deep, so Lemaise, you're going to be pulling water, you're going to be drawing water from a Makum Ptur. And therefore, as he says, 
Right, so, so again, so he says, Karmelis me ara moshkinan. So we treat the, we measure the tenth vachim of the Karmelis from the floor, from the, from, from, from the ground. Va'avira mokom pturu. And the Maisa, you're going to be, um, drawing water from a mokom pturu, because it's going to be above tenth vachim from the ground. Uvdinu diziz na'amu lolibai. And make her a din, you really don't even need this funny little stick, right? Because at the end of the day, you're drawing water from a mokom pturu into your boat. We just use a stick so that there's some kind of indication, some kind of hecker that, um, you know, that you shouldn't just be taking things from a Carmelis into a Rishos Ayachid. Rav Chizdev Rabba Bar Avuna Amre, whereas Rav Chizdev Rabba Bar Avuna say, Ose Makom Arba Umemale, whereas Rav Chizdev Rabba Avuna and Rabba Bar Avuna, they say that you need to create some kind of portable Rishos Ayachid, and because Kasavi Carmelis Misfas Maya Moshkinan. Because they say that, no, the Carmelis, we start measuring the ten tefachim from the um, surface of the water, which means that you're basically going to be um, taking water from a Carmelis, right? Umaya ara smichta, and we treat the water just as like thick uh, ground. Okay? We, we treat it as if it's part of the Carmelis. So, yilo avid makum arba, kamitaltum karmelis rishus hayachid. Therefore, if you don't create this portable rishus hayachid, well, then you'll just be taking water from a Carmelis. So, by by, by creating this portable Rishus Hayachid, and it's tr- treated as though anything under this portable Rishus Hayachid is also Rishus Hayachid. So it's considered like you're taking water not from a Karmelis, but from Rishus Hayachid. And then the, um, you know, you take that into your boat, which is Rishus Hayachid, Shalma Yisrael. Friends, that was Daf Kuf. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't like really prepare like a proper recap for Daf Kuf. I just, cause it took me, I'm sorry, I apologize, but it just, Took me, uh, it took me longer than I expected to learn, and I just it was getting late, and I just decided to just go right into it. Um, so yeah, sorry, lots of like Rishasa Rabin, Rishasa Yachid kind of stuff. Uh, have a good day.